around that, but it, but it was, uh, that's when it all changed for me. And I was just at work doing my job that day. I didn't make that phone call come in. So it, it, it and I, I, I'll take two seconds to say, I declined the interview because I'd just been promoted at Disney. <laughs> and a, a gentleman who I still have as a very good friend was sitting outside my door and heard the phone call and came running in <laughs> and said, what did you just do? Oh, well, I just got promoted and I love my boss and, you know. He goes, Bonnie, you're from the Bible Belt. You believe in stuff like this. This just fell from the sky <laughs> into your lap. <laughs> At least go meet the man. And so I did, and the rest, you know, continued. But it, it's, I say it out loud to you because being aware of opportunities, walk through the open door. It, it, it fell in your lap for a reason. Just go. doesn't mean you're going to go there forever, but in my case, I kind of did. <laughs> and Janice, as a uh, graduate of, right. uh, yeah, of so, college. So going out in Singapore, you know, film and Came and really feels like a very far-fetched dream for a country of 5.6 million mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to be a singer. And then my mother said, like, oh, Janice, you're not pretty enough to be a singer. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, all Asian mothers are like that. You know? so, we saw the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I couldn't go to music school because, you know, um, they're all private schools in Singapore. I couldn't afford so I went to film school at 17. It was a government school called Neon Polytechnic. I got my diploma and I actually started out as an editor. So I got my diploma, you know, and I was an editor and I edited my way through Chapman. You know, I somehow my lecturers, they thought that I was talented. So I was immediately launched into National Geographic, you know, hit, uh, Discovery Channel in Singapore during long form. And then when, you know, Bob Bassett, you know, Madeline Warren started Chapman University in Singapore, um, my professor from Neon called me and said, Janice, you need to come to this school. I said, no, I don't want to come back to the university. I don't have money. So I spent a year making money and I went as a second batch and I did a two-year program, you know. So shout out to Nana and Rona over there. They taught me. And Madeline somewhere who taught me. And then came out to LA do my internship, and no one wanted to hire a foreigner because, you know, H1B, lottery, sponsorship. So it was an exciting time because China was buying AMC, you know, was buying digital domain. And in my head, I'm like, I can speak Chinese. I can write Chinese. I should just go to China. So I went back to Singapore, you know, and then volunteered at Hong Kong Film Market, you know, my internship company, pitched myself, got three offers, they are all shitty pay, and I told my mom, <laughs> if I was going to be poor, I would rather be poor in China, not in Singapore. <laughs> so part of my language, I shouldn't say shitty, yeah, but anyway, so I, <laughs> so I moved to China, and the big break really came when I when I joined this company called Beijing Galloping Homes, and I started working with Terence Chung and John Wu. So that really changed my life. And because of that, because of that kind of exposure, I'm in whole pictures found me when they were, you know, recruiting in China. They were like, we need an international executive who speaks Chinese, who understands Americans, and yet also work in China. I'm like, that's very specific. <laughs> <laughs> so, somehow fit the bill, flew over to LA, and then went, and then they just bought Crazy Rich Asians, and then they're like, oh, Jan is a Singaporean, it works, you know? <laughs> changed my life again and, and then after that I started um, interviewing at Imagine and then I ended up at Imagine. But you see, yeah. I, I, I want to note all those wonderful things happening around her, well she's just being herself. <laughs> she's just being authentic yeah. and being herself and so many circumstances that you're not in control of mm -hmm. are happening around you and there you come. Yeah, I, I feel very fortunate you know, yeah. because like as a student it was so hard, in fact Rona reminded me of something that I told her when I was an intern. She asked me what was I doing at Mirror Pictures. 
I told her that I was filing contracts, but I'm also reading every contract <laughs> because I wanted to know information, you know, and I wanted to walk out my internship equipped, you know. So maybe you're right, you yeah. know, it's just picking up things along the way. Yeah, yeah and it's uh, what I tell my students all the time. You don't really know where the opportunities are going to come from mm -hmm. at all. And Hollywood has always been known, um, usually in front of the camera versus behind the camera, uh, in the earlier days of, of Hollywood, the actors all learned how to sing, how to dance, how to walk, how to do all sorts of things, because they never knew when the opportunity was going to present itself. And that really hasn't changed. And your point, Bonnie, of, of being yourself, and certainly staying focused on what it is that drives you, that gives you that passion, that purpose that we talk about, is very key. And it can, like everyone has, has just said, it can have different turns in different directions, but you stay nimble. It's kind of like being a ballerina, uh, mm -hmm. that you can be on your tiptoes and kind of move through. So with that, oh, wonderfulness, ladies, uh, let's talk about your biggest obstacles um, in your career. Uh, Vanessa? Well, it's interesting. I think the notion of being able to recognize opportunity and, like you said, just kind of walk through the door and and accept those opportunities. In some ways, obstacles can be personal obstacles too. Mm -hmm. That notion of, I'm a very linear kind of planner, and the notion of kind of really being able to recognize immediately when something represents an opportunity and not stumble in your recognition of it or acceptance of it is something that I think I personally have had to kind of push myself on and really kind of decide that challenges will come your way and you might, they might come with some uncertainty, but that you can leap into them and accept them. So I think in, in many ways, there are always the kind of what people consider the traditional challenges. Certainly as an African American woman, I experience challenges, but I think you know, for me, I have a strong personality and always felt like I deserved to be in the room and that it was important that my voice be heard. So those challenges, I think I've always kind of intuitively known how to combat just with my own confidence and strength of voice. But I think those personal challenges of knowing kind of when to accept opportunities that you might be unsure of is something that I think is important to kind of recognize. And probably that moment for me was I had spent um, a number of years in the main division at Fox doing live action movies. And when Chris Melodonji left to start Illumination, I had the opportunity to do animation. But I had never done animation before. And so to lead an animation company, having worked on CG films but never done a fully animated movie before, was very daunting at first. Mm -hmm. And it was one, and I was pregnant too, so it was one, and it was in the East Coast when I lived in the West Coast. <laughs> so the notion of not seeing those things as obstacles, but seeing those things as opportunities to learn something and to do something that I had never done before. Um, in a place that I had never done it, um, became an opportunity. But I really had to push myself to kind of um, take the leap. Bonnie? Biggest obstacle. Uh, I love a good obstacle. <laughs> um, I find obstacles incredibly exciting because I all I want to do is knock them out of the way. And... Some, and you can do that in many different ways, but what's interesting, I mean, I can think of like actual tangible obstacles that have occurred on certain motion pictures where we, you know, we can't film on a certain location. I hear that and I'm like, what? We can't film on a certain location? Give me a, give me a few weeks. They haven't filmed on that 30 years, they just haven't talked to the right people. You know, like, I, I love that kind of physical obstacles, but what I'm thinking about and listening again to Vanessa speak, you're really inspiring. <laughs> no idea. Um, <laughs> no, like you're really making me think about stuff I've thought about in a long time. I, um, the stuff that I thought, the things I thought were going to be my obstacles ended up being my strengths. Um, 
in my career. And I'm 53 years old. I just turned 53 on Tuesday. And we were Thank you. I didn't, I didn't figure that out until I was 38 years old. So I'm giving you a huge gift here. <laughs> but I um, was raised in the South. I was raised in the Bible Belt, a very religious upbringing. You know, church three times a week. You know, uh, we would go to chapel on the days we weren't at church. Like, I counted one time I went to church 13,720 times by the time I was 22 years old. So I came out here, and everyone in Dallas was like, you're going to, you're going to Hollywood? You're going to Hollywood? God doesn't even know about Hollywood. And so I was, and I have, as you can tell, I'm a kind of verbose, loud human, but I was a little embarrassed about my religious upbringing. And I wasn't myself in certain, you know, scenarios. And, and I might have an opinion or something of interest, but I would hold back because I didn't want to be judged for this upbringing. And at 25, I figured out I was gay, but that's a whole other no. subject. <laughs> let's, let's stick with one subject. <laughs> so... Cut to many years later, I'm sitting, Lori and I were just talking about this before, I'm sitting in these really great production meetings, creative meetings for, you know, movies like Saving Private Ryan or Schindler's List, or I'm sitting with all these Academy Award winners, and I'm still just me. I'm sitting, taking notes for Steven or doing, you know, whatever I do, and, but when the question is asked at the table, okay, well, for this sniper character, this boy from Oklahoma, we need some scriptures that he would say when he's holding the rifle. What would he say? Silence. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, who do you think started sitting up at the table? Mm -hmm. And it got called upon my biblical knowledge. <laughs> got called upon all the time, in every movie, in every scenario, constantly. So it was fascinating to me that I've been hiding this thing for so many years that actually made me special. So what I think is great about the chosen path you have, your career, the entertainment business, media, the arts, is that we get to wear our uniqueness out here, because that's what we get to do in this business. We're not putting on, you know, black patent shoes, except I am today. <laughs> black, you know, like working for Ross Perot EBS in Dallas, like, like I used to watch my dad do. You know, it's like, oh my God, they're all wearing the same thing. <laughs> Notice so all of us in black pants. Today. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, that's what I, it, it, the personal obstacles were mm -hmm. more the things that I had to embrace and, and use as assets. Lori, I'm sure you have had none. There are so many. Yes, I know it is. One of, I think, I'm just thinking, which one's the, the, the biggest one ended up for me being the biggest blessing. I, um, I, the first movie I made, um, the first movie set I was ever on was a film called Bobo, which was an anti-apartheid film back in 93. Mm -hmm. That's um, when we met. That's when we met. Yeah. And I had the pleasure of meeting Nelson Mandela, who came and saw the film in San Francisco at a screening and told me this was a very important film. It was my first film. Oh, nice. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven. And in my mind, I thought, how did Morgan Freeman play Nelson Mandela? Ah. <laughs> a movie where Morgan Freeman plays Nelson Mandela. So that's, that's kind of in the back of my mind. So now you the this story. So I uh, connected with this gentleman who, when, when, when the diva, when Nelson Mandela came out with Long Walk to Freedom, he basically said, I want Morgan Freeman to play me. So I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> Morgan and I, at that time, had formed a company. I've been in business with him now for 22 years. I started when I was very young. Um, and, um, and so we started working on this project, Long Walk to Freedom, and, we, and for 12 years, I would meet two or three times a year with the producers, we would talk through it, we'd give notes, we'd talk about you know, what we wanted to do. It's very difficult to put this man's life into two hours. Mm -hmm. So you know, one version was more political, one version was more family oriented, and we never quite got it right until about, I think it was 12 years ago, and it was kind of getting there. And so we 
we decided, okay, we should do this project. And I was told that, um, so we sent over, here's the deal we want to make, and I was told, oh, well, well honey, Morgan's going to be in the movie, but you're just his development person, right? So you're not, you're not going to produce this movie with us. <laughs> I'm, I'm working for 12 years with this gentleman. Um, and I was, I was taken aback, I was shocked, and I was really mad inside. But what it made me see is, wow, who was I being in those meetings? Like, it made me look at who I was being in those meetings and say, was I being someone that they could just say, oh, she must just be Morgan Freeman's development person? I'm kind of valuable. I get along with people. I am, I am uh, you know, when we disagreed, I would disagree kindly, but I, but I didn't take up the room like I do now after that event. And so the obstacle for me was myself. And Morgan Freeman, genius, said to me, well, we're just not going to do a movie. This is, this is me 15 years I wanted to do a movie about Nelson Mandela. I was, I was, you know, I remember sitting on the floor of my office, like, in tears, thinking, this is going away. Like, how can this go away? And Morgan said to me, I can't do his accent, but he said, darling, <laughs> when a door closes, a window opens. You have to trust. Every movie, every project has its time and its team. Mm -hmm. This is just not the time and team. And I, I promise you, I, I wanted to leave him so badly, but I was so upset and so, I just thought, I screwed this up. How could I screw this up so badly? I'm not going to get to do this amazing project. And I kid you not, four weeks later, on my desk comes a book proposal for this thing called Playing the Enemy, which was one event in Nelson Mandela's life, which was the 1994 Rugby World Cup. And I read this story, and I thought, this can't be true. This happened? It was a pretty, it, it seemed like a made-for-the-movies made movie. And um, I called Morgan, and I said, do you know about this 94 Rugby World Cup that Mabuba was involved with? And he said, oh, of course. And my first thought was, well, why didn't you tell me this like, 10 years ago? <laughs> and, uh, and he said, of course. And I said, maybe this should be our movie. And literally within a year, we were, we got a script written, we optioned the book, and we were in South Africa making the movie Invictus. I, it is, uh, it was like soul soothing for me to have a moment where I thought everything that I wanted to do for 14 years was going away mm -hmm. and have a person in my life, Morgan is my business partner, pick me up, literally almost physically pick me up and say, this is not the end, there's something better. And it's, it's like what Bonnie was saying, there's some, you know, if you, we believe, I believe we're here to make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you can just trust that maybe something that looks like the worst thing that could possibly happen, 12 years of what you've been working on going away, and going away as a choice, can actually turn into something beyond what you even imagined. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank, thank God for the grand pioneers, you know, before you, yes. <laughs> change, you know, the reality of certain things, you know, you can't really change the situation, but what you can do is to affect the environment, you mm -hmm. know. I think, for me, it's a bit different. I grew up in Singapore, you know, so Singapore is very gender neutral, so I never thought that I'm a woman, you know, we go on dates, we go Dutch, which is very weird, you know, so when I dating, when I started dating here, no one understood why I would put my credit card there. <laughs> revolution is that Mao really empowered women. There were many women leaders and you could see it in business, you know, film industry. I was working at a Chinese studio where my bosses were all female. So I so I never thought I'm Asian, never thought I'm female until I moved to America. I'm like oh. <laughs> Very 
very new executives are younger because you know um, it's very specific right we need to be bilingual so we're all a bit younger so when we put into rooms there's a lot of pressure and I learned a few things you know Hollywood can be not just sexist but also very anxious you know you're too young or too old to do something and and I was just learning you know because what a friend told me in the channel is you just have to own up, you know, this is you. Because for the longest time, I always thought that being a foreigner would be my biggest weakness. But I realized that that makes me a very keen observer of trends and culture. And that's why I feel like, you know, I can just move countries like two times, you know, go to Asia a lot for business because I know how to be a chameleon, right? So like I said, I, my, my takeaway here in the stories, you know, reflecting upon myself, you know, yes, we can't change the reality sometimes, but we can affect the environment, you know, through empowerment, you know, through knowing <coughs> who we are, talking to our friends and family, we go get the support, you know, endorse each other. I think that's very important. So, any of you ever think about leaving the industry? Anyone in any? Really? I would cry in the shower. <laughs> so I really, any day, even though you didn't go through with it, but it's that that's it. That's it. I'm done. It lasts maybe an hour, but anyone have an experience like that? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, it's a it's a job. You know? And there are days where I just want to stay home. And, you know, watch something on TV and remember what it used to feel like to not have to create that stuff, but just enjoy it. <laughs> um, but, my, but again, my moment of, uh, well, maybe I should do something else, was a personally motivated moment. I, um, you know, I worked for 15 years with Steven Spielberg, and it was great. I, it was the best graduate school I have ever attended. But I didn't move out to Los Angeles to work for Steven Spielberg. I moved out to Los Angeles to make the movies that I fell in love with as a child. You know, like uh, Broadcast News, Terms of Endearment, you know, Fabulous Baker Boys. You people have probably never seen any of these. <laughs> um, but Somewhere in Time, you know, like these like romantic, character-driven, actor, you know, Morgan's movies. You know, like just the, that's what I really came out here to do. And um, and I had a mentor in Stephen who was, and Kathleen Kennedy. Um, and Kathy went through a very similar thing that I did, where you just, you want it to be of your own. You know, you want to create something of your own. So I went out there and did it on my own. Stephen was very supportive. And man, do it on your own was a lot more difficult. A lot more difficult. And there was a year where I was really considering uh, all sorts of options. I never had a crisis of, I, I know I'm a capable human being, so I knew if I chose something different, it was just going to be what I spent my day doing. You know, it was, there wasn't some big, like, you know, mountaintop moment. But, um, but, uh, I then walked through the experience of making a film called Albert Knobs with Rodrigo Garcia directing and Glenn Close and Janet McPeer starring and it was this incredible like character driven period drama. We ended up getting nominated for a few awards and I met my future professional partner Julie Lynn who Lori knows and now Julie and I have made 10 movies together. So it was, I was really, I'm really grateful that I hung in there um, and didn't allow sort of that vague year to, to take me off of a path. And I think I've gotten some really good career advice in my life. And I, I had those, I had crises like that. I remember at Disney, I had been in it for about a year and I was so frustrated. I wasn't making any overtime. I was, I, all my credit cards were maxed out. I was like, I'm, that's it, I'm quitting. I'm selling my car and I'm moving to New York. I'm going to go live in New York City. And my brother was like, uh, build off of, you know, what you've done so far. What are your relationships? Who can you talk to in your life that could maybe help you take a more sane step? <laughs> it's really good advice. 
And I and I have at moments of sort of being at a crossroads in something, I've always paused and I've heard my brother in my head, okay, wait. Who's my who are my who's my team? Who are my people? Who can I go sit and talk to and sort of figure out how to build off of what I've already done and not, you know, go back to ground zero. But um, I still wake up and I'm not sure I'm doing what I want to do. I mean, when you guys called us and asked us to produce the Governor's Awards, that was it for me. Like, I really want to produce the Academy Awards some year. I, you should. And that's like a, that's a big dream for me. So I'm not currently doing the only thing I want to do, or necessarily the thing I'll do the rest of my life. So, a very confusing answer, I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, each day, you know, many discoveries. Vanessa, have you ever wanted to leave, even if it was for a moment? I mean, for me, I just, I love storytelling. So, for me, it's, it's the business and an industry, and it's tough and all those things, but my love of storytelling always prevails. And, you know, that's kind of, I, when you mentioned the notion of a vague year, which I thought was really wonderful, because everybody has a vague year, where they're like, wait, <laughs> what yeah, exactly. Like, is this right? And I think getting over those things, you know, to me it always goes back to I started this because I loved something. Mm -hmm. it, I didn't do it because of some notion of coming to Los Angeles and you know any any glitz or glimmer of anything. I I wanted to do it because I love stories and I love watching movies and for and I will always love stories and watching movies. I think. <laughs> and it's not, you know, I think the interesting thing about the times we're living in as well that I'm excited about is just the evolutionary process of how storytelling is going to kind of have different twists and turns and ways you'll see it. And um, because we're living in this exciting kind of explosion of, of the movie business and streaming and technology in a way that we've, the likes of which no one's ever seen before. So the notion of being able to kind of have this passion for what you love and this kind of landscape where you, you're you not sure what how it's all gonna, um, what all the venues and opportunities are gonna be, that is motivating. Yeah. Well, that segues into another question um, that's gone from the audience. What challenges, trends do you foresee for future generations that will impact their work in entertainment? You, you, know, you just brought up the new trends and certainly uh, technology, and Lori, as a computer scientist, has always impressed the hell out of me. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's changed, in my mind, and probably for a few of us, quickly. Uh, it's, it's probably been about 15, 20 years, um, but... For us, it's actually kind of sudden. It, very slowly, but it's a major change. It's a major change. And none of us know the answers, right? William Goldman is right, nobody knows anything. But starting with you, what do you see, even now, um, just trends of the future? Um, well, thankfully for all of us, story is still king. Um, no matter where I go to talk about technology or what the new platform is or is it going to be short form or long form or medium form or all of the above, the, the thing that every single company, brand, anyone who has money wants is their own original content. So I think for us, all of us, that is, that's music to my ears. Um, even advertisers who are losing their way, they don't, they don't get network television eyeballs, they don't really even get online eyeballs unless you force it in the middle of a story. Um, they're trying to figure out how to crack into having people understand what they want to sell you. And they're looking for original content that's not, you know, hey, buy my spark as well. They're looking for unique ways to, to, to have their brand, even if it's just a brand about being in community or a brand about being healthy, um, in storytelling. So for me, that's exciting. And the other trend is this the whole short form piece. And you know, we grew up in the world where you needed a 
you know, between 95 minutes and 120 minute movie because movie theaters needed to turn around people and that seemed to be about the best, you know, best timing and or network people wanted you to be able to tune in on an hour or a half hour. So we've grown up kind of pushing our stories into these kind of artificial boxes. And the thing that's exciting for me is we now can can really have the story tell us how long it should be and 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 how many episodes it should be. Maybe it's seven hours and there's lots and lots and lots of episodes or maybe there's seven one hours or even or and or you don't even have to have an hour now. You can have fifty two minutes or which for me as a filmmaker is really free. So I'm excited. I think there are way more opportunities now than even, you know, thirty years ago when we started for independent producers and directors to get their stories out. And Janice, since you represent a major trend, and that is co-production mm -hmm. around the world in different languages and, and studios and companies, uh, producing uh, film and television specifically in the different markets, how do you see the, the future? Right. Because you're it. Yeah, so I, I feel very thankful that I grew up at a time when, you know, internet is accessible. So to me, it's, it's like part of my life. And I grew to harness it, you know, use it to my advantage. And, I, and also, I work with China a lot. And when it comes to social media, you know, um, online assumption, China is way ahead. You know, when you talk about the short form videos, you know, the stories, they were already making money out of live streaming before Instagram introduced, you know, the live streaming using celebrities and whatnot. I feel like the challenge really is the evolution in the technique of storytelling, very much to, to what Laurie's saying, you know, like how do you stay attentive to consumers? Because, you know, the way they consume content will dictate how you tell stories. So as an international executive who works at American company about developing local language content. That to me is my everyday challenge, as you said it. You know, how can I tell a story that Chinese people like? And how do I tell another story that the Indians would like? You know, because they all, you know, see it differently. I would say, don't be afraid of technology. You know, learn how to harness it. You know, and this is also why I travel a lot. Because I feel like unless I'm in, in that environment, I don't know how to tell their stories. So for example, I'm developing a, um, a Chinese language TV series for Imagine. You know, it's their first venture. Um, they are very excited. I'm scared. The Chinese people are excited. <laughs> I'm still scared. I'm still very scared because, it, because you see, my biggest challenge is how can I make Americans understand that, you know, Chinese people consume content differently, mm -hmm. you know, and, and also it's right, and there's no one right way, you know, we learn three acts, you know, we learn the 22 steps, you know, here, here in American uh, universities, but over there, melodrama is real, you know, no matter how much you don't like it, melodrama is real, you know, and I feel like it has to do with society, you know, you're not speaking much at home, so you want to see drama blow up on screen. <laughs> there are many reasons to that, right? And how can you say what is right and what is wrong? And also the way that the Chinese people write, you know, their treatment, their Bible, it feels like a novel, you know, and if I leave it to my co-workers, they, they will get very frustrated because they, they'll be like, Janice, I don't see the story, I don't see the character, and I have to distill it. You know, and I have to invent a hybrid development model, you know. Mm -hmm. I have to go to my Chinese writers, okay, I understand what you're saying. Can you try saying it this way so that they can understand you? And then I have to go to the Americans and say, okay, you know what? What you want is actually in there. Let me show it to you. So, this is what I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so stressful. But, you know, I feel like that's the future, right? You know, technology with all that. Then if language could evolve, you know, American language has its own lingo, you know, Singapore language would have this thing called Singlish. As with storytelling, you know, we will evolve, you know, but how can we embrace that? You know, and I feel like, like, you know, Bonnie, you know, you said you're like a good challenge, you know, I feel like people should, you know, welcome challenges, you know, don't be scared, you know, just 
embrace that, you know, harness that. <coughs> okay. Um, I'm a little nervous uh, about going out to the big world of um, Charlie Waters. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there, I know you, we've all, I know the three or four of us have seen a lot of, of difference and change. Um, but again, still not enough. Uh, and what could make it enough? Where do you see areas of opportunities to be in the room, you know, especially where decisions are being made, um, that could be a little bit better in how to get there? I'm going to start off. I knew this question was coming. Of course. <laughs> um, I'll just be myself, which I can't help but be. Uh, I think one of the secret of my success, I'm only speaking for myself. Number one, I have been incredibly lucky. I have worked with incredibly generous and smart men who loved hiring women. <laughs> and I mean Sam Mercer, I mean Sam Mercer in that regard, my, my first boss at Disney, I mean Steven Spielberg, he works so well with women. Mm -hmm. and, and they're good, good men who had wonderful mothers. And, and literally, like, are just the kindest. I cannot say enough. So I have this very rare experience, but good Lord, have I heard stories. And I am so grateful they have not been part of my experience. That said, what has been going on, uh, you know, very visibly for the last months, last year, have made me think back. And I have often been the only woman in the room. Often. And there is, uh, there was an obliviousness to it. The fact that I'm only recognizing it now um, that I regret. And, you know, my producing partner Julie and I, we are dedicated have been on the last several productions to bring in as equal from a from a, a gender perspective and all perspectives as, as, as balanced and equal a, a tapestry as we can in our productions because it makes the best art you know and um, and that said I I think I have um, you made a really interesting comment earlier that really touched me where you said, I didn't know I was Asian or female until I came here. <laughs> I really deeply, deeply, deeply relate to that comment. Um, I have always been so, I'm just me. So I don't really know, you know, I, I my life experience personally comes from being this straight Christian girl in Dallas, Texas to being this gay woman in Hollywood. So I can't really tell you, I, I evolve every day. So I love, I think, I, I tell young people, which I guess you are, <laughs> since I'm a pioneer. <laughs>
get in that creative writer's room, to get to get that gig in that director's seat. I think producing, for some reason, maybe we women are good organizers. I, don't, I have no idea. <laughs> but I don't think that my career path has been, there were a lot of women, there were a lot of pioneers ahead of me, a lot of women I could look to and, and count on and, and, and rely on. We've all been here for each other, but but I think those creative fields, and I've heard from way too many women, that's been a real uh, a real challenge that is getting better. Lauren? Um, well, I think the good news about being producers, and, and uh, this only dawned on me, I don't know, about five years ago, is we don't have to rely on someone hiring us, because we produce. So there's something really interesting about being a female producer. You need people to give you money. That's a whole other story. But, but we create the product that somebody wants. And I haven't had the situation where I've created something that I felt like somebody didn't want to do because I was a woman. It was a good right. product. Right. So that's the, that's the benefit of if you're taking the producing path. The interesting thing that's happened, because I've been doing this for 20 years now, is I used to go in with women on my director's list for every movie. And even though there were, you know, four or five, they'd be on there, and literally none of them would be at the top of the, the list that the studio gave me, or the agents gave me. And now, I'm getting lists that if you don't have a woman on, it's a problem. And the agents know it, the studios know it, or, or a person of color. Like, it is not okay to send in an all-white, cis, male list. It just doesn't happen. And that is a huge, huge, huge leap. And I feel like, yeah, I feel like, so on, on Madam Secretary, we, um, we were given the mandate from CBS that we cannot have, we had to have at least 40% females or people of color, but we've blown past that now. That was five years ago. And I was really happy because I came from the feature world. And so there's a real commitment, and it's, there's no better time, especially speaking from me who has a lot of um, stories about women and people of color that I've been talking for 20 years. People are now calling me saying, wait, you have the right to that story that no one has heard yet? And I'm like, yeah, for 20 years, happy, you're, happy you know about it now. But it's a great time for us because people are hungry for it. Everyone sees, Morgan always says, our business is not black and white. It, it's really about the green. It's what's making money. And right now, women's projects, projects with people of color are making money. So we have a great opportunity now to kind of ride that way. Um, I think as producers, we have two obligations. One is bring as many heads of departments that you can into your productions. Take the extra time, because in our business, sometimes it's like you just call your friends. And if we call all our friends that we've been working with for the past 15 years, many of them might be white males. So sorry for the white males here. Um, but, but look outside, and by the way, Many of those women and people of color are really, really, really qualified. They've been sitting doing their own projects. They've been doing a lot of really great work. So there's this whole plethora of people out there ready to jump in on our projects. Mm -hmm. And then I, I also say we need to bring people in on the PA level that aren't only just our friends and family. We need to reach out. There's a great program in New York called Ladders for Leaders that's sponsored by the state. And they basically send to our set four interns, four PAs, um, every uh, season, and they pay for them. And we, you know, have them work in every department and get trained up because that's where you know our very grassroots kind of um, crews that we have, where people kind of mentor themselves up. So I'm partner. And so Vanessa, um, you and I have just even a little difference, and, and Janice certainly talked about. Hers, and I, and, and I love that comment too. You didn't know you were a female or Asian until you came here. Um, but Vanessa, you and I have a slightly a little different story. So, with regard to that, adding the extra flavor of color, um, how has you know that impacted, or how do you see changes, uh, and certainly in, in the rooms that matter, uh, executives, very few. I think you're the only new one. Oh, no, one or, well, certainly with the title of president uh, at a studio. I think there's a there's an obligation that studio executives and everybody has, and you guys certainly mentioned it, to be conscious of the decisions that you're making. 
and conscious of the opportunities that are being created and the offering uh, of who they go to. And I think that um, certainly when you are an executive of color, you, you see the world in a broader, more diverse way because you're a broader, more diverse person. If you're a, a person that has had a global experience, you're going to see the world in a broader, more global way. So A, I would make a pitch for some of you guys to think of being executives because often people don't think of that in terms of going through film school. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly, when I first mm -hmm. came, thought of wanting to produce and write and kind of found myself on a path that led to being a studio executive. And I really, really urge you to kind of think about, um, especially in the world we're in now, because there are a lot of people at companies that are deciding kind of what kind of movies, television are gonna get made. And, and there need to be different kinds of people in the room when those decisions are being made. So that's my pitch for being on that side of it. And also, I think, um, as a writer and a director, I think it's really important in film school to acknowledge the power of your voice and the importance of your voice, just as much as it's important for studio executives to acknowledge the need for your voice. Um, I had an experience with a student at one of the film schools that came to me, and she I reviewed some of her material for her thesis, and at the end I said, this is really great. Now, where are we going to take it, and who, do you, who are you looking at in terms of a manager, and all those things, and she was really surprised that that would be the place that I would go to so quickly, and I could tell that she thought of her project as a student project, but didn't quite yet think of herself as a filmmaker. And so I think you have to go out into the world having done these programs, knowing that you're a legit filmmaker with a legit voice. Well, it sounds like uh, an important um, characteristic or quality one must have is uh, to build that confidence of, of self and the power of self. And certainly, going back to the words, purpose and passion and perspective of self. And we women, I think it's better now, uh, have, you know, sort of back in our head, when we were young and little and growing up, of being a certain way. You know, you reference, well, maybe we're great producers because we're able to pull things together, but we can not get it done, which is probably true, um, which I think we should absolutely celebrate. In a, in a very big way. So I would say what I've heard from you all is the the power of self is very important. Um, and yeah, it does slip away every once in a while. Uh, and when it does, you need to grab a hold of it uh, for whatever length of time. It could be three minutes. It could be a half hour. Um, and get back on that horse, so to speak, and to be true to self. Do you all agree? Anybody have a little comment more about it? What about Jan's? Yeah, so I was just reflecting on everything that we've said. Um, I have a 14 year old baby sister. Oh, I thought she was going to say baby. There's <laughs> 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 a lot of shocking news here. <laughs> Whenever I open my mouth, I realize things. <laughs> um, it's just 14 years old. I. When, when I went back home to Singapore to shoot Crazy Rich Asians, I brought her on set. And, and it was that crazy wedding, remember, there's a banquet with the super trees and all that. So she was there, she saw Gemma Chan, she's like, I'm so in love with her. I'm like, so do I, I'm in love with her too. And, and then, you know, the camera operators naturally let her play with the, um, um, the camera for a bit, you know, she put together the, the battery and all that, you know. And then after the whole thing, she told me she wants to go to film school. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> what have I done here? Because number one, my mother is going to like, look what you've done. <laughs> and secondly, I just 
have this, you know, revelation that I'm woman and I'm Asian, right? So I'm like, oh no, what's going to happen to her? Which is why I feel like it's important to be a good example in her life, you know? So last year, I flew her to Los Angeles to spend 10 days with me in LA. Yeah, um, I signed her up for art lessons. I'm like an early tiger mom. I'm like, go to art lessons, you know. And I make her go buy her own food. I'm like, don't be afraid of the white people. Just go. <laughs> to go to film school, sure, you know, but I also want to experience art and life, you know, I brought her camping at Joshua Tree, so my takeaway really is, like, like you said, self, you know, if we can be good examples for young people, you know, then generation of younger, younger people, they're just going to change the environment, change reality, and I just want that so badly for my sister, and and I called my mom, I'm like, man, she has a great time, she had a great time here, she wants to go to film school. Um, my friend is talking to her about going to USC, I said, Chapman, but he said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My mom was like, who's going to hire her? I will hire her in the yeah. future. That's so why I told my mom, you know, just wait for me to be successful and hire her in the future. Yeah, so I, I really feel like self is important, you know, how to be how to be that person whom you wish you met when you were in your 20s, you know, when you were in film school, how to be that person that you wish, you know, um, to endorse you when you were in your film school, I think. I just want to be that person. Yeah. That's right into what advice would you give your 21-year-old self <laughs> for entering the industry? It's not right? too far. Like, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah. passed it. Again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what would you tell your 21-year-old? I know that's an old, tired question, but I always find it interesting how people respond to it. Vanessa? I would tell my 20-year-old 20, 20 self um, it, to embrace how you're different, to embrace who you are. Like, I'm never going to walk into a room and kind of fade in. Mm -hmm. Like, there's just Not no yet. way. Like, even if I say nothing <laughs> in this line of work. It's just not going to happen, nor should it happen. And I think, for me as a woman of color, the importance of um, being who you are unapologetically and really not paying much attention to, um, you know, you could feel very insecure. You could feel... Um, a whole host of feelings being the only one in the room, and you kind of have to, uh, you know, the, the pioneer spirit in you kind of <laughs> has to, um, and Cheryl was a pioneer too, I want to acknowledge. Um, so and is a pioneer. I get one more legacy award. <laughs> <laughs> But the notion that like you should speak to this too, the notion of having to somehow def sometimes define your own space and make it yours and be okay with that and set that path for other people um, to feel comfortable with themselves too. Is that a question for me? Yeah. <laughs> Um, say the question again. <laughs> what advice would you give your 20-year-old oh, self as um, a that year? Someone say something? No, um, yeah, because I do get asked that question, and I say, it was a book title, I think, once in a book, just don't sweat the small stuff. Um, you, you think it's important. I had a colleague who had this the, the word 10. Is it going to matter in 10 minutes? Is it going to matter in 10 hours? Is it going to matter in, you know, 10 months, 10 years, and when you realize after the 10 minutes, it probably isn't, then breathe, you know, uh, because we are in a business that's a lot of money, it works extremely fast, and full of incredible
incredibly smart people. Incredibly smart people, as much as many people outside of Hollywood don't understand that, that, they know <laughs> that we are, uh, but very smart, knowledgeable people. And um, you're, you know, certainly young, nervous about making a mistake because you figure it's going to be like a you know, brand on your back and for the rest of your career, they're going to you know, keep pointing back at what a stupid thing you did or said. Um, but they don't. You know, they actually have bigger fish to fry, usually. Mm -hmm. And so it really doesn't matter. You know, you can still be upset. Gosh knows I've spent many a time pushing my chair back and saying to my assistant, I'm going to walk around the lot until I can calm down so I don't quit or, you know, smack somebody because I'm so angry or being passed over for positions over and over again. Um, but stay true to myself, right? Stay true to what I want. Um, and I want a career. So if you have to eat crow, you know, or whatever, um, think about it for a while and then think of it in terms of yourself and you. What do you want? Are you going to let this derail you? Well, maybe you shouldn't be in this business anyway, because it's pretty darn tough. So being faithful to self is very, very important. Do you have any words of wisdom or thoughts that you might have had in your heads that you wanted to put forth today to our wonderful audience of students and faculty and friends of Chapman? That's something that I wish someone had told me when I started in this business, um, because I didn't train. You know, my first movie I was on, I was one of the producers, so I kind of learned it as we were going. Um, I, I thought I was going to meet somebody who was going to tell me the answer on, on, how, to, on how to do it. Like, right? I thought every time someone said no to me about financing a movie, well, if I just had whatever... Steven Spielberg has, right. or Tom Hanks has, right. or whoever. I really thought that once I once I got that, I would have it all figured out. And over the years, I've had the opportunity to talk to people like Stephen, Tom, and what I was surprised to hear is almost every single one of them has a project that they've been working on for a while that they, they still haven't been able to get made. The difference between people who are making things in Hollywood and not are the people stayed who got things made. The minute you leave and say, I'm, I'm going to give up, it's too hard, I don't have the right answer, I don't know what I'm doing, you won't get it made. And so slow and steady wins the race. And you have everything inside you if you're really a storyteller. You have what it takes. You'll meet a lot of people that you'll need to help you along the way. But you have what it takes. Just keep going. Well, I think Vanessa said something uh, again. Again, Vanessa. <laughs> um, going back, uh, the the reason you stayed in it, even though you might have had a vague year here and there, yeah. is because you love it. You, it's it's one of your first loves. Mm -hmm. I'll 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 put I'll put the statement a little bit, but that for me, um, what I uh, reconnected with after my years working with Steven, where I became very good at making movies about World War II and dinosaurs and aliens. <laughs> I mean, I got to where I knew in 20 pages if this was a project that Steven was going to be interested in. But I forgot what I liked. And when I uh, came out of that and got my own deals and started developing my own material, um, I had this moment. It took me six months to, to read a script for me. And um, and it's not a bad thing or a good thing. I'm blessed to have those years, but it's just interesting, right? And I what I did, and I don't remember going, oh, this will be smart. <laughs> I just did it authentically as I went out and rented, because that's what we did back then, <laughs> went out and rented my favorite movies, the ones that I had fallen in love with, and I rewatched them. And then I went and found, which was not as easy back then, the screenplays mm -hmm. for those movies because I had never read mm -hmm. the screenplays. Mm -hmm. So, and I and I studied those screenplays and I understood why, understood what that movie was doing to me <laughs> and why and when. And um, and that's when the very personally fulfilling part of my career began. 
Um, so it was really reconnecting with my love of it, and not it, not just being about the tasks of the day, but the story and the themes. There's this incredible exercise, and I can't tell you because if I tell you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> but my partner does this great exercise, my producing partner, where she figures out what your thematic is, and she asks all these really great questions. We'll go to lunch. Okay. <laughs> but it's this thing they do up at Pixar, but it's really secret, so I can't tell you. But she figures out, but you, know, you think you don't need to know how, because your, your thematic is your thematic. But when a director or a writer is a little bit lost in the development of the project, she gets in there with them and helps them reconnect with that core thematic. And you look at Spielberg's movies, it's in every one of them. You know, there's a, there's a core thematic that we as storytellers are attracted to and also want to tell. Um, and that's, you know, and then the only other thing I would say is, and this is for me, there's probably a different version for you guys, but when I have a weight of the week is on me, I literally will take three hours, two and a half, however long, I will go to a movie theater. And I will go into a screening of something I've heard is good or, you know, just came out that I don't know anything about. And there may only be three other people in the theater with me, but I will go, I, I, I say go back to church. i got to go to church this afternoon. I have got to go to church. I have to reconnect with my faith. <laughs> so I go back into the dark theater, and I get my popcorn, and I watch a movie. And, you know, one out of every 10, 15 times, if you're really lucky, you hit one that's the whole reason we do what we do. So reconnecting with that first love aspect of it, I think, is really, really, really important. Um, just a, f a few more uh, moments here, uh, talking about the word disruptor. Uh, but these days, there is there are so many more um, platforms for distribution than there were 15, 20 years ago, uh, for sure. Uh, to the point that uh, I was talking about this with someone the other day, and it's just so overwhelming now. Uh, you know, we all, it, it's been diced up so, so much in my mind. Um, and someone will always come up and say, have you watched this new show? You know, I've never even heard of this show, never mind watched the show. And uh, I wonder, in your journeys, the impact of, um, of the different platforms. Uh, Lori, you know, you, earlier on you talked about uh, truthful, and this is the, the, the real truth of it, I, I think, is it is about storytelling. And there is now more of a freedom, if you will, uh, because stories can can be two minutes, um, or it can be two and a half hours, or some, I think, um, the new, um, forgive me, I think it's Avengers, um, Endgame, is it Avengers? Um, is three hours long. Kill me. Kill me dead. Um, <laughs> I would say it would be a game. <laughs> yeah, three hours. Okay. Um, but how has, has this uh, changed your approaches to uh, storytelling, filmmaking? Do you decide beforehand, oh, I think this will really be great in this platform? Is it, is it a different way? Um, certainly with the script and how long, and da, 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 and da, so can we uh, talk about this, over, you know, next um, ten minutes? Five, no, ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Lori? Uh, it's such an interesting question, and I've been dealing with this very subject because I'm, I need to hire a new film exec and a TV exec, and the very fact that I had, they're both scripted, and the very fact that I had two separate, because in our business that's kind of helpful separated film and TV. Um, and I thought, why do I need to, why should, why don't I have two execs that just do scripted? We have a factual division, but just do scripted. And then we're going to look at material, because right now a lot of our um, series that are going on just streaming or whatever came from feature films that I could never quite like get right in a two-hour script. So we're like just looking at a lot of material that we've had before. So for me, I've kind of like, change the way I'm even going to structure our company 
when I do my next hire that they're going to just be scripted executives, um, so that they're looking for the story, and then we're, and then we'll decide who the buyer is going to be. So let's first, what's the story? Where is it going to have the biggest impact? Where is it going to be able to get an audience? 